a five-year gap. I don't understand people that are five years younger than me. For some reason, I'm, I'm, uh, 10 years is even worse. I don't get it. Before, I could relate. I could understand. I understood the lingo. I understood why they would say that. Now it just doesn't make sense. The kids have said, sir, you're making dad jokes. I know I've transcended uh, the line. And so, church, I ask that now that I've lost the children, that I gain you. <laughs> this morning's sermon speaks about, the, the whole series has been about the superiority of Christ and of Jesus. This morning we're going to look at the superiority, superiority of Christ's covenant. Tim Mackey says it this way, Jesus the Messiah is superior to all forms of God revealing himself in Israel's past. Everything was revealing the Christ to come. And he is superior to all of those things that were spoken about. Him. Now in this text they speak about two covenants. And when I did the study I thought, oh my goodness, pastor did it again. Gave me the difficult one. We would need at least two, three, four weeks just to go through the technical stuff. That relates to the covenant. But this morning, I'm going to say it in a simple way that we can all understand it. And so that we can have some context. Both covenants were initiated by God. The old and the new. That's why it's called the Old Testament and the New Testament. Both of them were designed to bring people into a special relationship with God and with each other. Both covenants were meant to do that. The first covenant with Israel was with Israel. That uh, God made when he took them out of Egypt. And the other covenant, the new one, is made, God made with the church when Jesus died for the church and rose from the dead. The first covenant created the nation of Israel and the new covenant created the church as we know it today. Both covenants have obligations of faith and obedience, but the first covenant depended on human initiative. It was too dependent on us. And as we know from the scriptures and from the scripture I just read, that the Israelites failed and they could not keep. But this one depends on the finished work of Jesus Christ and the work that Jesus is doing in you and me every single day, not on ourselves. And this is the major difference between these two covenants. So you have to understand at the time, in the context, here you had Jews who wanted to go back to the old way. They had the tension of going back to the old way, the old covenant, where it was dependent on themselves. And those who... Were a re that were stuck in that way of living. They didn't want to give up the old way. And so you would find in this text, a lot of Old Testament is read. And I'm so grateful this morning that I read a lot of those Old Testament texts. They are difficult to read, I, I must say, but Hebrews makes them a little bit more plain and a little bit more simple for us to understand. But for us to go forward with today's message, we need to look back at what we learned last week. Why is Christ's covenant so superior? The reason his covenant is so superior is that one of the reasons was he had to be a priest. See, for when the priest is changed, the law must also be changed. And this is according not to me, but according to Hebrews 7 verse 12. Hebrews 7 verse 18 to 19 says, The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. It wasn't the law that was weak. Let's just get that out of the way. The law of God is not weak and now when i end today's sermon i'll refer to that the law of god is not weak human nature our condition is weak the law was perfect because it was made from god instituted by god we fall short so it was weak and useless for the law made nothing perfect and a better hope I spoke about hope a couple of weeks ago a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to god and this hope that is introduced as we draw near to god this hope is introduced through Jesus Christ. So my first point this morning is Jesus is the guarantor. I learned a new word this week. A guarantor of the better covenant. Jesus is the guarantee of the better covenant. A guarantor is a personal thing that gives or acts as a guarantee. Jesus himself acts as a guarantee. Now I know there's the warranty and the guarantee. And sometimes they get mixed up. And sometimes we don't know which one is which. But Jesus here is an assurance that this will take place. And it has happened already. Hebrews 7 verse 20 to 21. And I know I said we have to go back. So that this week. because Remember the, the scriptures were not written in chapters and verses. They've done that so we can make sense of it. 
Hebrews 7 verse 20 to 21 says, And it was the old way was without an oath. Others became priests without any oath. But he became a priest with an oath. When God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Jesus came with an oath that he would be priest forever. So he is a sure guarantee because he is forever. Think about our guarantees that we get with our devices that we buy. It is limited. Even more limited today. I think of conversations I've had with my grandparents and some folk in the church might relate. I won't say you're old. I'll just say you will relate. That certain things were made to last. They will always go, oh, these, new, these things are not made to last. My grandparents recently bought a kettle because of load shedding to put on the gas stove. My mom said, this thing is already peeling. Spent so much money on it. 200 rand. And I was like, ah, 200 rand? No. Not really that much money. But contextually, 200 rand is what some people were earning back. And then so I have to understand. And in the same way, we need to be contextual when we understand the text. Sometimes when we relate to one another, we have to understand the context that people come from. And so Jesus here is a guarantee because he is forever. And this is what God said that he would be and Jesus would become that. Because of this oath, because of the oath, because Jesus is forever, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Hebrews 7 verse 23 to 25. Now there has been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. There's been many priests through the generations because death is inevitable for human beings. Our time in office is limited to the time that God has allotted each and every one of us. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely because his priesthood is forever. He is a sure guarantee because he is forever. He is able to save completely those who come to God through him. You have to go through him. That is how you receive this guarantee. Hey, it's like, you know, when they stamp your thing at, the, at macro, don't stamp that thing, there's no guarantee. If they don't write in that box, there's no guarantee. If you don't go through Jesus, there is no guarantee for any one of us. Because he always loves to intercede for them. He loves to intercede for us. Jesus is your guarantee this morning. Christ has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is a guarantee of the salvation who is to come through God, through Him. I want to remind everybody this morning that if you leave here, be reminded that Jesus is your guarantee. This morning, I'm going to be reading a lot of scripture. You know what was amazing about this, this sermon? I didn't have to cross-reference everything. Anything. Everything was there. It was one of those ones where, as, as I read it, God spoke. Burst into tears this morning. Thankfully, it was just me and the dog. And, and she, she didn't really understand. She was just kind of like looking at me and... and but, but I was so overwhelmed. And it wasn't even emotional. I didn't even know why I was crying. I couldn't explain it. I, my, I know my wife wants to see me cry, but it just doesn't happen around people. But it's like when I was me and, and God, it's a little, I, just, I just cried. And I'm not saying this to sound more spiritual because I can't even explain why I cry. I would like to say it because I'm an emotional person, but it was literally just reading words. And I'm going to read them to you now. So my second point is Jesus is not only the guarantee, but Jesus is the mediator of a superior new covenant. It's not just a new covenant. It is superior. And it's not superior because it, it is different. It's superior because he's involved. The old covenant, as I said before, was not bad. We made it bad. We failed. But now Jesus has to step in. So Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. And, it's, and it is established on better promises. Hebrews 8 verse 1 to 2 says this. Now the main point of what I just spoke about, this guarantee, the main point is of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest. It's not just saying that Jesus is a guarantee. We're telling you that we have the high priest who is the guarantee. We have him. He's here. We're not speaking about somebody who is to come. We're telling you that the Christ has arrived and he is superior and he is here and he has arrived. Who sat down at the right hand. Now the high priest is his, his mediator as high priest. Who sat down. Sat down speaks about his kingship. Because priests never sat down. They say it's anthropomorphic. 
It's when you give human qualities to something, either a, an, a being, a heavenly being, or an animal. But obviously in this case we're speaking about God. So an a, a angelic being, God, is, is given this, that God is seated. Now we know heaven, we, we've never been there. But God uses words to give us an understanding of what heaven must be like. So we know that Christ is seated as a king who sits down. So he's seated in a place of authority. It says that he is seated at the right hand. The right hand means he's interceding for us. He has God's ear on our behalf. And this is in Christ Jesus. This is what makes our mediator so superior. It's because of his position and where he finds himself where he is placed he is placed at the right hand of god seated there but he's also a priest and and this is is what makes god superior than any king that has ever lived this is what makes jesus more superior than any priest that has ever lived hebrews 8 verse 3 says every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer jesus was the priest he was the one making atonement right but he was also the gift he was also the sacrifice a, a priest would never sacrifice themselves they would bring a sacrifice jesus here is both both priest who makes atonement for our sins but he's also the gift for god so loved the world that he gave his only son he's also the sacrifice he is the atoning lamb he's both priest and sacrifice both priest and gift therefore he is our mediator now, this is where it, it got real for me, so I'm hoping somebody else cries too. We have a high priest who meets our needs. He is holy, blameless, pure, set apart, exalted, does not offer sacrifices day by day for his own sins or for the sins of people. He sacrifices for sins once and for all. For the law appoints a high priest and men in their weakness but the oath which came through the law appointed the son who has been made perfect forever the law appointed priests even though they were weak men they were men like you and i and they too had to make atonement for their sins before they could walk into the tabernacle to make a, a, atonement for any other person or they would be judged but here jesus is able to walk through all the way without without blemish because as i said before and i'm going to read it again he is holy, he is blameless, he is pure, he is set apart, he is exalted. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices day after day for his own sins, for the sin of people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. And he's been made perfect forever. He stands before God on mankind's behalf and offers himself as the solution to the sin problem and as the solution to our salvation. This is the mediator we have. And the word mediator, yeah, they speak of an arbitrator. Somebody who comes on behalf of like that final part of the CCMA. And Jesus is that final link between us and, and the, the solution. And the resolution of what is the outcome. And he's a perfect solution to our sin problem and to the need for salvation. Hebrews 8 verse 6 says, in fact, the ministry, this ministry that Jesus has received is superior the ministry that he received is superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. For it is established on better promises. It is established on better promises. So we have a guarantee in Jesus, but we also have a mediator in Jesus who acts on our behalf. And thirdly, Jesus is the fulfillment of the new covenant. He is the one that was spoken about in the book of Jeremiah. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. There would have been no need if the, if the first covenant worked. But now listen to where the problem comes in with the first covenant. It says it in the scripture, but God found fault with the people. It wasn't the covenant that was an issue. It was you and I that were an issue because it was dependent on us. Not the law, but humans was the weakness. It was the problem. Christ became for us what we were unable to be. Through Christ a new covenant was promised. And through Christ a new promise was fulfilled. It was promised that it would come through him. He has come. It has been fulfilled. 
because we have an assurance and a hope that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is interceding on our behalf. He is in the place that he said he was going to be. And he did all that he said he would do. Now, I love this. The new covenant says this. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. Ezekiel 36, and this is how Jesus fulfills this. Ezekiel prophesied about this in Ezekiel 36 verse 21. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to give my laws. I want you to listen to the actions that God is going to do. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you towards my decrees. And be careful, and, and be careful to keep my laws. He will do that, but we have to do that through Christ. I was battling with this because I was going, so, but now, but now, what? Don't I get it? No, no. God, moved. when I read the scripture, God speaks and He starts to change. The, but now, the moment we don't read, I'm not saying that you're salvation, but you're not going to grow. The whole, this whole section is about warning people about maturity. A couple of weeks ago, we spoke about you should be eating meat, but you're still drinking milk. You should be teachers, but you're still being taught. You're still having to be taught the basics about our faith. Jesus, God says, if you walk with me faithfully, I will do this for you. Because I'm starting to, I'm starting to realize the reason why we still struggle with certain areas in our heart, because we haven't allowed God to work in it. It's not because God is unable. It's because we haven't given God the access to move in our lives, to commit everything to Him. Not just by word, but by motive and action. It is difficult to walk this walk. It is difficult to follow the steps of Jesus. But you are not doing it on your own. And this is the reminder we have a guarantee and a mediator and one who has fulfilled that. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will know me, all know me. We are not dependent on a priest or a, 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 a biblical leader to lead us to God. We can meet God where we are at. We know God. We don't need to travel to Jerusalem. We don't need to sing those songs of ascent to a specific de destination because God is here right now and He can meet you where you are. And I love the next line. From the least to the greatest will know God. From the least to the greatest. A friend of mine has gone through a very difficult time in, in his own life and we were chatting and he'd come to visit and he shared a story of a gentleman we worked with. And he, he was the caretaker at the school, a young caretaker, out, about my age. He's a year older than me. So he's older than me, just a year older than me. And he had gone through, had quite a horrific life choices that he had made. Uh, in Mitchell's Plain, lived in Mitchell's Plain, unfortunately got caught up in the wrong settings. And he then found himself at the school. And, and the time that I met him, he had just gotten saved. And the work that God can do in somebody's life if you surrender it to him. This gentleman today is preaching um, in Mitchell's Plain. He recently bought a, he got married, um, beautiful wife who, who, who sings in some worship team band, a local worship team band. And, but, but he said to my friend, and, and, and I, I'm supposed to call him this week, he had said to him, he, he bought a house in Hazendal, which is in Kales River. And he said to him, when I was going through all of those things, when I was living that life, I never thought that I would be here and find this kind of peace. Because the peace that he's found is not about the area. He said it's not about the house. It's not about, it's about finding this small peace that I can raise my child and my, 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 his children in, in a better environment that he grew up in. But also, even better than that, raise them up in the presence of God. And, and that for me, because we were speaking we were, he was sharing what he was going through, my friend, and I was talking about my issues about the weekend. When we shared this story, I said to him, some stories just eat different. And all of a sudden, we stopped complaining. The moment we spoke about the blessings that God has done for somebody else, not even for us, all of us are like, oh, I can't complain anymore. God is good. There is hope. There is, there is hope for us. And I think sometimes we need to hear that. That sometimes your situation is, but sometimes we look at other people's lives and situations, look at what God did. 
We can cling to that too because guess what? We serve the same God. And the Bible says we ought to celebrate people's victories in Christ. We ought to celebrate it. And we need to mourn with those who mourn. We need to celebrate with those who are celebrating. The sins that God forgives, God forgets. The end there says, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. The sins that God forgive, forgives, God forgets. We unfortunately remember things and hold things against people, but God does not do that. The promises of God are complete forgiveness. And it's a, a wonderful promise. And I want to end by saying this. I want to read the last verse, verse 30. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. This phrase requires several comments. Number one, remember the, the historical setting. There was a group that was clinging to the Mosaic law. And there was a group who was thinking about going back. Context of this. But it's true for us today too. We can try to live in our own strength. Or we can try to, or we live through the strength that God enables us to do. We can make decisions without God, or we can make decisions with and through God. Secondly, this only has to do with the law as a means of salvation. This is not eradicating the law. This is speaking about our walk and our salvation with Christ. Because the, the Old Testament was and is God's revelation. The Mosaic law still has a purpose in God's plan. It brings people to Christ by showing our fallen humanity. The Ten Commandments, they still have a place. They still show us how we, how we fall short. It shows us that we are fallen humanity. It shows us our sinfulness. And it shows us our need for salvation. The law still has a purpose. The Lord tells me and you that we need salvation. It helps us understand God and His ways. How He wants us. Because if you think about the Ten Commandments, they speak about the relationship with God and they speak to our relationship with people. No other God, steal, kill, those affect you and I. No other God, no idols, resting in God, those speak about our relationship with God. It is related to the new covenant promise to be fulfilled. It was incapable of bringing salvation because of the weakness and sinfulness of fallen man. See, the law could not bring about salvation because we fell short. Jesus Christ brought our salvation because as we just learned, He's perfect, he's blameless, and only he could be the difference. So this morning I want to remind you, Jesus is the fulfillment of the covenant. Jesus is the mediator. And then Jesus is our guarantee. Amen. God bless the reading of his word. Let us just pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we want to say thank you this morning. I pray that this message would encourage us to cling to a relationship with you. To walk in step with you. To seek you in all things. To seek you for all ways. To seek you for our lives. A lot of the songs we sang this morning, Lord God, spoke about committing ourselves back to you. And I pray, Lord God, that every day we would take up our cross and follow after you. I pray, Lord God, that we would find our strength, all we need in your scriptures, and that you would speak to us. I pray, Lord God, that we would be encouraged by others and that we would encourage others that we would rejoice Lord God when others are rejoicing that we would mourn when others are mourning I pray Lord God that this new covenant that you have made with us Lord God that we would walk with you I pray Lord God this morning that this sermon would inspire people to desire to know you more just like the Berean church uh, when Paul spoke to them they would, they would go home and see if what he had spoken was true and in the scriptures. So I pray, Lord God, that this would invoke within us a desire to know you through the scriptures. For you truly do speak. I pray, Lord God, that we hold on to your guarantee. We hold on to knowing that you are a mediator and interceding. I, I'm, I think of Romans that says, Lord God, that even when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. So I pray, Lord God, that you, Lord God, are seated at the right hand of the Father. And you, Lord God, have our best interest at heart if we give our all to you. All of this can only be accomplished through you. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. If you don't mind standing with me to receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. God bless you. Amen.